Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I ask that you would grant us not only faith, but faith that endures. I pray for your help and strength in the trials that we face in the Christian life. And I pray that as we run this race, we would do so with joy, that you'd help us to clearly know you and that knowing you would be an eternal source of joy and hope and peace and that it would be so evident in our lives that people would long to have a relationship with you because they see what you are doing in us and through us. Lord, give us that kind of faith. Give us that kind of endurance. In a day when many are tired and many are dropping out, help us to persevere. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Guys, I want to say a special word to you today. And uh, girls, don't check out. This is going to have to do with both of you. And I'm going to ask you to hear me out for just a couple minutes because I'm going to speak to guys in a way that I think they'll appreciate. And I think you will appreciate it too in a minute. I want to ask you, for those of you who have dated, can you remember a question from your girlfriend that caused all kinds of fear and anxiety and panic when she asked it. I believe that basically every woman in a relationship will ask this question and it usually doesn't take very long. And as soon as I say it, some of you are gonna break out in a cold sweat. Some of you are gonna laugh and you're gonna remember times that you got in trouble. But this is a question that reveals a lot. And I remember when I was dating my girlfriend, who is now my wife, both her asking and my anxiety and struggling to answer. And so here's the question. Why do you love me? Why do you love me? I hear ripples of nervous laughter. Why do you love me? Now, That's actually a really good question. And I felt on the spot, like like a test that you didn't study for, like I didn't know we were gonna be talking about this right now. But when I tried to answer, I couldn't give her a lot. If I'd been real honest in the moment, you know, we hadn't been dating very long, but but if I'd been really honest in the moment, I I probably would have said something like, you're kind of cute. I don't have the gift of singleness. Hoping that we will enjoy holy matrimony together in short order, and we're working on it. Dating in our culture makes it really difficult to answer questions like that, honestly, because you need to know someone's character. You need to know them at a deep level to be able to answer that question well. Think about characters in the Bible, like one of the most wicked women in all of the Bible, Queen Jezebel. If you took Queen Jezebel on a date to Cedar Point, she would have a great time. (laughs) You guys would be like, I think we're made for each other. (laughs) Because you haven't done anything to see her character. And I can tell you, you know, as we dated, one of the things my wife and I did, like we, we attended church together, we, we served together. One of the reasons I married her is we went to a service out in Goodrich, uh, at the church that's now the river out in Goodrich. And it was a college and career service in the barn and we had some, some good music that we were singing. And I remember the guy preached this message from the book of Hebrews and it was, a, it was an intense message. And I had graduated from Moody Bible Institute and I was like, man, I don't know if I agree with everything in this message and was just kind of wrestling with it. And I watched my girlfriend just be reduced to tears as she was humbled before the Lord. And I watched her repent of things and she just told me like, I I am not right in my life with God and and with my mom in particular right now. And I thought, whoa, Uh, this woman has the ability to humble herself before the Lord. And that actually says something a lot about her character. And I can tell you after 14 years of marriage, there are a lot more reasons that I can describe to you why I love my wife, but the initial relationship needed to be tested and tried, and we needed to see each other's character 
in order to answer that question well. Now the reason I'm asking you this is because I think the same is also true of our relationship with God. If I were to ask you today, why do you love the Lord? I think most people, if you call yourself a Christian, you say, well, he he saved me from my sin. He he forgave my sins. Jesus died on a cross. He was tortured for me and and he rose from the dead and he's promised to give me eternal life. And that is all 100% true. And there is no way that I want to diminish that. But if that's all you know about God, don't misunderstand me. If that's all you know about God, you don't have a mature faith. Hebrews says that we should move beyond the elementary principles. Elementary, like elementary school, like basics. We should move beyond the basics into deeper and richer and fuller truth. And the reason I'm talking to you about this is just like there are a lot of relationships that are based on superficial things and they will not last because there's no substance, there are a lot of people that have a superficial relationship with God and it will not last because there is no substance. And so I wanna do a couple of things this morning that not only describe the nature of the problem, but also talk about what it is to be sound in the faith. And my text today is in the book of Titus, and I'm especially gonna be looking at Titus chapter two, verses one and two. And I would give you kind of a homework assignment. I've got a couple of things I'd encourage you to do today. Read the whole book of Titus. Because while I'm really building this sermon on the phrase, sound in the faith, you need to see everything Paul says in the book to make sense of that. And what I want you to do today with me is to understand that in a time where many are falling away, many churches are struggling, God has given us things that will strengthen us and deepen our faith so that we can run that race with endurance. And I will openly say, I am talking especially to guys today. Ladies, you need to listen. All of this applies to you, but God has designed us so that men should be leaders both in the home and in the church. And I think one of the reasons the church struggles all across America and the West is that very often guys have not led. And so I want to give you some tools to help you lead, to encourage you, but I make no apologies for doing what Paul does here in Titus and addressing the men of the church, helping them understand what it means to lead. And ladies, I'm not leaving you out. You can certainly see places, whether it's Priscilla, who has a lot of training and theological knowledge. If you you look at the book of Acts, she definitely helps with Apollos. It's not diminishing that in any way. You could think of Timothy. Paul tells us in 1 and 2 Timothy, Timothy's mother and grandmother were pivotal in the formation of Timothy's faith. So I don't wanna diminish that. But I wanna tell you, one of the reasons churches are struggling is because dads have struggled to lead spiritually and this is a passage that I think can help us tremendously. I'll give you some statistics, you know, and take it for what it's worth. There are a couple of research organizations that I think it's like a thermometer. You can at least get, get a feel for the temperature, and then you can try to figure out why that's the case. They say that about 64% of people in America today would identify as some kind of Christian. It doesn't, you know, maybe you were just born into a Christian household or whatever, but roughly 64%. And then within 50 years, they're saying that will drop to between 54 and 35%. Uh, Those are sobering statistics. If If you pay attention, most churches are not growing. Most churches across America are shrinking. And as our culture wrestles with deep issues of truth, One of the things that we need to wrestle with is how do we endure in a time where many are falling away? The same study talked about the reality that one third of people who are raised in church 
will walk away in early young adulthood. One third. Make that personal. Think about it. If you have three kids, one of your kids. Uh, I, I have six kids, so two of mine. Think about if you serve in children's ministry or in youth group. Look around at faces and think, who's not gonna be here in just a few years? What can we do to help young Christians endure in the faith? And I believe Titus has some very clear things that we can do. One of the reasons, aside from the fact that this is how the Bible describes leadership in the home and the church, that I feel strongly about speaking to the guys in the room is that there is good evidence that dads do pass down their religion tragically regardless of whatever their religion is. So there's a psychologist by the name of Vern Bengston, Nancy Piercy, uh, quotes his study in her book. Vern Bengston did an award-winning 35-year longitudinal study. So 35 years. This isn't just a survey that you fill out online. He spent 35 years researching, trying to understand why do some kids continue in the faith of their parents and why do others leave? What makes a difference? And Vern Bengston, who is not a believer, said that 68% of children who have a close relationship with their father will carry on their father's level of religious participation for good or bad. So dads, you're in church every Sunday, you got a good likelihood of influencing whether or not your kids go to church every Sunday. Dad, if you go to church on Christmas and Easter, you have a good likelihood that your kids will inherit your unfaithfulness. And so there's good reason in addition to how clear the Bible is for us to think about how can we lead in our homes and in our churches so that future generations are sound in the faith. And if that's the nature of the problem, I wanna get a little bit more specific. It's, it's not just that we don't always pass the baton. It's also that there are different motivations for it. And one of those reasons is our culture puts a persistent pressure on us to deny things that God says are true. But that's no different than what was true for young Titus. And so if you haven't already, I wanna encourage you to open up your Bible to Titus. It's a very short little book. I'm gonna read you my primary text and then we're gonna go through the book and show you just a couple of things that I think God gives us to help us in this time where so many people are not enduring. Titus chapter two, verse one says this. But as for you, and he's speaking just to Titus at this point, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And we'll talk more about what sound doctrine is in just a minute. But he broadens it and he describes older men, all of the older men in your church are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in the faith. That's where we're gonna spend most of our time this morning. What does it mean to be sound in the faith? And why does Paul say that all older men in the church need to be sound in the faith? And also in love and in steadfastness. Now, you could, like I said, you need to read the rest of the book. He has very clear instructions to older women. He has instructions to people who don't enjoy a lot of freedom. And all of his instructions are helpful. But in this message, I wanna talk about what it means to be sound in the faith, and particularly how we can help our churches be sound in the faith. And so if we take seriously Paul's instructions to older men, if you're a younger man, the goal is to get here. Nobody starts out mature in the faith, none of us do. But the goal is to help us mature, and so how do we do it? Well, first we need to understand what causes people to be unsound in the faith? What pulls us away? So in Crete, look with me at Titus 1, 12, and 13. Some of the funniest verses in the Bible. Paul says, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Now, pause for a second. Imagine if he said that about Americans, okay? Like, like, 
Titus is sent to America to help establish churches all across America. And Paul tells him as he goes, Titus, you gotta know, all Americans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. You'd be like, hey, 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 hey. That is not fair. Well, he's quoting someone else. So then the question, does Paul agree with this or not? Look at the next verse. He says, this testimony is true. Like, oh my goodness. So what do you do? Throw your hands up and find an easier mission field? No. He says, Titus, here's what you do. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Man, that's not an easy message to hear. Paul says, the health and strength of the church sometimes depends on a pastor being willing to rebuke the culture. Man, we love being winsome. We, we love the approval of men. You don't get it with sharp rebukes. And yet, if you don't sharply rebuke error, you won't be sound in the faith. So part of why we are not sound in the faith is because cultural pressure comes in and we don't always resist. I, I thought a little bit, what might Paul say to us as Americans? I, I, I don't know that all of us are uh, gluttons. Some of us love exercise. Uh, I, I love it probably more than it looks like. Uh, not all of us are necessarily liars or evil beasts. What would he say about it? Well, think with me for a moment. Uh, just what's generally true about us culturally as Americans? Well, I think all cr Americans love recreation and pleasure more than the worship of the living God. That is generally true. We live for the weekend. There are songs about it, right? Everybody's working for the weekend. All Americans rely on themselves more than fearing the living God. I mean, that's the message of every Disney film. Just believe in yourself. That's, that's the work ethic that says, I'm a self-made man. Paul would say, no, you're not. And sometimes those cultural pressures are almost invisible. How about this one? Uh, so I think every American holds himself as the final authority on every subject with no respect for the authorities that God has established in government or in the church. You disagree with your pastor, you find a different church. You disagree with your doctor, you find a different doctor. You disagree with your government, you got a right to rebel. Well, I don't think it's that simple. God has given us clear instructions on when and how to submit. Yes, he's also given us pretty clear instructions on when to resist unjust authorities, that's for a different message. The problem is all of us consider ourselves the final authority. You know, one of the criticisms that my Catholic friends love to level against Protestants is that Protestants treat themselves as the Pope. They're like, you, you didn't just get rid of the Pope and say, we don't believe in the Pope. You made yourself the Pope in the process. Everybody says, oh, I have the way to understand this. And if you disagree with me, well, I have a right to my interpretation. And so the dismissal of authority that God has instituted in the church is a massive cultural problem. Now, it's, it's not unchecked authority. Your elders get their authority from the word of God. So, so if your elder says or does something contrary to the word, you ignore them. You, you know, there, there's a truth that says, you have to do what the, what the word says, but your elders use the word as they exercise authority. And there are many times where a pastor will open the word of God and say, this is what the word of God says. And you say, well, that's not for me. And you leave. And that's one of the reasons that we're not sound in the faith. Now, there's another issue. And that, that is not only do we feel cultural pressure and not only are we hesitant to submit to godly authority, but there's easy shifts in doctrine, even among people that are trying to resist culture. And I could mention a couple names. One that came to mind is, is Preston Sprinkle. Uh, a couple years ago, he wrote a book with Francis Chan talking about what the Bible says about hell. And, and at the time, uh, I don't think this is true now, but at the time, Preston Sprinkle was respected as a faithful Bible-preaching pastor. And 
because of his ministry, many people looked to him and appreciated that he wrote a book on a tough topic. Well, today, he totally disagrees with everything he wrote. Says, you know, I've changed my mind. I, I don't think that God sends people to hell for eternity. And so there was a doctrinal shift. I'm not 100% sure what motivated it for him, but when you look at major areas of doctrine, it's possible that you can try to resist culture, stay part of the church, and also change your doctrine at the same time. You can be so open-minded that you can reject truth that the church has embraced for 2,000 years and say, ah, I, think, I think we know a little more now than they did back then. And so doctrinal shift is another reason that we're not always sound in the faith. And then there's a, another kind of unsoundness where you could think about somebody that, man, they have all the right doctrine, but they deny it by their lives. So you could think of some of the famous scandals like a Ravi Zacharias, a famous Christian apologist, preaches the gospel accurately and faithfully, and then secretly abuses women for decades. And the scandal hurt thousands and thousands of people. You can deny the truth with your morals, and there are tragic cases of that, not just nationally, but even locally. And you could also think of the pressures from your life, trials that will test your faith, whether it's a cancer diagnosis or a divorce or the death of a child or all of those things will try and test your faith. And in a context where so many people are giving up and abandoning, the difficult things in your own life will make it difficult to endure and persevere. And then the last thing, think about this across generations. So perhaps you might end your race well, but will your kids and will your grandkids? If you look through the history, not just biblical history, but American history, it takes three generations typically for God-fearing people to have godless grandchildren. And so how do we pass the baton so that the future generation, well, in order to do this, I wanna talk for just a second about defining our terms. So if we define the terms in Titus 2, I'm gonna talk about two of them, what it means to be sound and what the faith is. So first, sound. It, it comes from a Greek word named called hugiaino, I mean, for what it's worth. It means to be in good physical health and free from error, to be correct. So if somebody is sound of mind, it means they're not crazy. If a bridge is sound structurally, it means it's not gonna collapse. And if you are sound doctrinally, it means that you got your teaching from Christ. So you don't invent it, you don't follow popular opinion. Peter says, we did not declare to you cleverly invented myths, but they declared the Christ that they saw and lived with. So there is a historical person who taught us, recorded in the Gospels, what God said. And you can look at the Old Testament and how much Christ emphasizes all of the things that are in the Old Testament. And if you point to Christ as the source of your beliefs and conviction, your faith is sound. But if you change and abandon what Christ said, your faith is unsound. You and I do not have the ability to create truth. We can't invent it, we can't discover it, we have to receive it. And so, when you look at what Paul does, look with me for just a second at Titus 1.1. Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is someone who's sent on a mission, like an ambassador. Why is he a servant? How is he an apostle? Well, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. So Paul receives his message directly from Christ. He conveys the message, you need to repent and believe in the gospel. And then he explains how to live a life of godly conduct. It's for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. There's a knowledge piece of this. But it's also for godliness, for the character that goes along with it. So the first step in enduring is listening to that message, being opened not only to the gospel, but to sound teaching and making sure what you believe isn't informed by popular opinion, but it ultimately comes directly from Christ. 
So let me think for just a couple seconds. Do you believe that God could change? Like before you answer that question, a lot of people do. A lot of people say, you know, the God of the Old Testament is so judgmental. He's angry, he's violent, he's racist. And yet the God of the New Testament is a God of love. We love the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament is kind of not so great. But God says over and over again, he does not change. And Jesus embraces the God of the Old Testament and calls him father. And Jesus describes future judgment that is just as serious as anything you'll read about in the Old Testament. Have you read Revelation? It's a serious God who has holiness at the essence of his character. And so God does not change. Jesus is not more loving and tolerant than the God of the Old Testament. They're the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you believe that God changes, your faith is not sound. And if you believe that the Bible is a human book with human errors, your faith is not sound. So yeah, how do you connect that to Jesus? Well, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus says, this is Luke 16, 17, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. He said in Luke 24, 44, everything in scripture about him had to be fulfilled. In other words, everything in the Old Testament would come true. And so Jesus has a very, very high opinion of the word of God. He believes that the spirit inspired it. And so if you think that the Bible is a human book with human errors, your faith is not sound. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian, but it means you've got a weakness in your faith that's dangerous. Or think about what Jesus teaches about hell. Jesus teaches more about hell than anybody else in the Bible. And so many Christians fall prey to the lie that says, you know, a loving God would never send anybody to hell. No, a loving God would send people to hell because evil is deeply harmful to the things that he loves. And so because he is a God of love, he will not allow evil to hurt the world that he made. And so in perfect justice, God certainly does send people to hell. Or you could think of any of the other cultural lies. You know, love is love. Well, no. Not only did God say that he made man and woman in his image, Jesus affirms that from the beginning, God made us male and female. You don't have the right to change the teachings of Jesus when it comes to marriage. Or, and this is maybe the least popular, if you believe you as an individual believer have the right to defy the authority of your elders when they are standing on the word of God, you do not have sound faith because Jesus instituted elders in the church. The church is his idea. So you can't say, I follow Jesus, but I don't follow the church. That doesn't work. Jesus established the church so that your faith will remain sound. And so these are all the things that can make faith unsound. Let me go back to my opening analogy for just a second. Okay, so, so I, you know, my girlfriend says to me, why do you love me? And I say, ah, you're pretty, okay? Well, think about all of the ways that love deepens, okay? It, it deepens usually in painful ways. So just to give one example, uh, when we were expecting our second child, uh, my wife had a really terrifying couple of days where we thought we were losing her for sure. And so we, we rushed to a hospital and the doctors did what doctors do, right? They never tell you, oh, you're gonna be okay. They give you the worst possible scenario. And so we immediately thought, I'm gonna be a widower. Like, th like th this is really serious and terrifying. And in those moments, your character really gets shown, whether it is solid and can survive testing or whether it's flimsy and it buckles under pressure. Do you curse God and shake your fist when life is hard? And in those moments, I can tell you, I love my wife more now because I saw her with tears in her eyes trusting the Lord when life was truly frightening. Those are the times you don't wanna plan a date like that, right? Like, hey, let's try to make sure that one of us is in life-threatening peril so that I can know if your character is good. Don't plan a date like that. 
But that's where you find out if character is worth being united to. And friends, everything that I've just mentioned is really hard. And that's where you find God's character. You find God's character in the things that you wrestle with. You find God's character in the things that confuse you, that push back against the lies of culture. It's not pleasant and fun. But when you understand God's character at a deep level, you will have a faith that endures. And so what is that faith? If I've talked about soundness, and I've defined it as sound faith comes directly from Christ, it's preserved in scripture, it's given to the apostles who appoint elders, and elders help us know what's sound in the faith. Well, what is the faith? Well, the faith comes from the word pistis, it's the same word as believing, but it doesn't just mean believing, it means trusting and living in light of God's truth. So you do things because you believe. So, so you're baptized because you believe. Baptism doesn't save you. You do it to show I've trusted that Jesus died and rose again and he did it for me. And so because I believe that, I'm gonna show everyone my faith in a public demonstration of faith in Christ. Or you, you say no to the temptations in your life and say yes to the high calling of holiness and you put in action your faith. It's not that that saves you by obedience, no, I, never. You're saved by faith in Christ, but your faith begins to transform you so that you live a life consistently and the faith starts with theological truth. All of Paul's letters do this. Romans, first half is theology, the second half is what do you do with it? Ephesians, Galatians, all of them. You start with difficult doctrine and you move to what do I do with this difficult doctrine? And the faith, I believe, can be summarized very concisely. You could look at a passage like 1 Corinthians 15, one through four. Paul says he receives this summary of the faith and the church uses it as they evangelize and as they baptize. All it says is Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture that he was buried and on the third day rose again in accordance with the scriptures. It's a beautiful summary of why Jesus came, what he did, and the fact that he rose again. You could think of, I love creeds and confessions. I love the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. One of the reasons I love it is because Christians for thousands of years all across the world in different languages have embraced it as a very short summary of what Christians believe. It's super helpful. So the faith is that body of truth. It includes things that sometimes we would say are not essential. So, so like when Paul is passing on the faith to the Thessalonians, he teaches them about the Antichrist of all things. Like you think, like, why is that super essential? Well, they were suffering deep persecution and Paul wanted them to know, well, God has this planned out. So, so you can survive persecution because you know that God planned for these days and difficulties. And so Paul gives a complete picture of the faith. In Acts 20, he describes it as the whole counsel of God. And I think it would include many of the things I've just mentioned, things about God, things about scripture, things about the church, things about end times, things about baptism and communion. It's a full picture of the faith that we all need. Yes, you're saved with a very simple message, but you need to grow in the knowledge of the truth for the stake of your stability. So the faith that you need to be sound in is trusting and living in light of God's truth as you heard it in the gospel. And one of the things that is challenging about this is there's both an intellectual component that some people say, man, I'm, just, I'm not book smart, I, I don't need that. And, and I wanna lovingly say, you do need some of it. You don't need to get a degree in theology, but you do need to be willing to learn. And so the mission before us is to remain sound in the faith. And I wanna to point to Titus to show you how Paul does this. So look with me again at Titus and look at chapter one, verse five. Paul says, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you may put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And then he gives the qualifications for godly elders, people who are sound in the faith. Notice at the end of verse nine, an elder has to be able to give instruction in sound doctrine 
and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So friends, I believe one of the most essential things that we need to do is we need to have relationships with our elders. You should know who they are. You should be able to talk to them. You should be able to ask them doctrinal questions. Have that relationship because Paul says they are there to guard the flock from false teaching. They should know the Bible well enough to be able to instruct you so that if you have a question, they will show you what the Bible says. And so the first thing that we need to do in order to remain sound in the faith is have that relationship within our churches so that our elders are able to teach. Now, there's a couple things that go along with that, and this, is, this might get a little dicey. I'm gonna open a can of worms, and I've got like 30 seconds to close it. So dads, I believe you have a responsibility in the home, and I wanna give you a tool to do this. Um, I was hoping I could get my twins up here, but they, they are a little shy, so they, they didn't wanna come up here. But I wanna explain to you what I do. So I use New City Catechism both in our home and in our church so that we have a good picture of doctrine. And it gives this little question answer format. I'll give you some simple ones that we use with our Awana kids. If I say, how are we saved? We have a room full of little Awana kids that go, by believing in Jesus. Okay, that's a great start. What do we believe about Jesus? And they say, he died for our sins and rose from the dead. Okay, and that's another good start. But right now, I'm actually teaching them about the Bible. We've been doing this for years, and they love it. They, they answer back super loudly. And right now, because we have that foundation, I'm teaching them about the Word of God. And if I ask them, what is the Bible? They will say to me, the Bible is the written, inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. Now, do they have any idea what any of those words mean? Not yet. They will in about three weeks. Here's what we're doing. We are laying a foundation of doctrine so that when someone challenges the word of God, they have a place to fight from. They know what it is and they've seen why we believe that. That doctrinal instruction is so pivotal. And I mentioned New City Catechism. There's a free app. I, I've never done this, but get your phone out and download the app because you have 52 questions that show you every area of doctrine. Some of them will challenge you. In fact, in my church, there are people that say, man, pastor, I can't believe that. I don't believe that. I'm not saying you're gonna agree with everything right away. I'm saying it's a good place to start for you to study. Now, some people are like, are you Catholic? Protestants really invented catechism, and then we got bored and forgot about it. So, so the truth is, this has always been a fantastic systematic way of learning doctrine, and I believe the church needs it for its future stability. So if Pastor West comes back next week, what did Phil preach about? He, said, he told us that we should use a catechism. And, and I don't know, he, he might call me, he might not. He knows me well enough, he'd be like, oh no. I believe the doctrinal instruction is the most important part of this, and dads, you can do this with your kids. I've got four-year-old boys over there that they know the answers almost as well as their nine and 10-year-old siblings because it's fun and we review it every night. If you depend on the church to disciple your kids, you're being the dad that will not continue in the faith. But if you disciple your kids in your home, you've got a much better shot of encouraging them because they'll see this is not just something we do around other people on Sunday. This is something we do every single day. So if we're gonna continue in the faith, you need your relationship with your elders. When you read something in New City Catechism, you're like, I don't know about that. Find Todd or find, I, I, told, uh, I told Kurt Bombeck that I was gonna mention him by name. Find Kurt and, and find one of your elders, whether it's Emery or, or Michael or, or any of them and say, hey, does the Bible really say this? And maybe you'll find out it does. Maybe you'll find out, you know what? We don't really agree with that. And you guys will grow as you study doctrine together. But dads, I'm serious. 52 questions and answers. Put the app so that it only gives you the kids answers because they're shorter. And try this with your kids at home. You can make it super fun. You can bribe them with M&Ms. You can make them do goofy voices, but teach your kids the faith in such a way that they see this is not something that mom drags dad to church. This is not something that we have to do. This is something that dad leads in. 
Because if you lead well, your kids will follow you. And as you do this, I'll also openly confess, I love catechisms and creeds and confessions. It's just part of how God has wired me. I don't know the answers to the New City Catechism because I never memorized them. So my kids just figured this out last week. They were like, Dad, if we ask you the questions, can you answer? And I was like, "Mm, no. Dad, you might feel like you can't do this because you're not equipped. You will be equipped as you do it. So don't give excuses and don't say, I can't. You can. And I believe the endurance of your family and our churches depends on your faithfulness as a godly dad passing on the faith to the next generation. So if we're going to be sound in the faith and endure, we have to have that relationship with elders. We have to be open to receiving teaching. One way you can do that is through studying a catechism. Another way, being involved in your small groups. If you're here and you're depending on one hour a week to develop your faith, you're not gonna be sound in the faith. You can't do it. So you need to be active in a time where you're taught And you need to make sure that you're faithful in that. You're not gonna do it with just an eight-week class once in your life. You have to be faithful in seeking that kind of knowledge. So the relationship with your elders, the relationship with that knowledge, and the last thing I'll close with, you have to be faithful in worship. Okay, so remember I said this is not just head knowledge. This is something that involves your emotions and your heart. And so I'll tell you, one of the most difficult things, because of how God has wired me, I I struggle often in worship, okay? Like I look at people having deeply emotional experiences and I think, man, must be nice, uh, because God has not wired me to immediately feel those feelings that I see other people having. And so one of the things that is essential, one of the reasons that worship is commanded is because worship is like medicine for your sick heart. It's medicine for my sick heart. And so as we sing songs together and as we sing loudly, the Lord can take truth in your head and help you feel it in your heart. And so as you worship together with other Christians, you see where you see that about, well, Hebrews 10, 25, don't neglect the the meeting together as is the habit of some. And some people use that verse to be like, you have to be in church, but that's not the tone of the verse. The tone of the verse is you are to encourage one another. Nobody feels encouraged after being yelled at, right? Like, like get in church. Oh, I feel great. No, but being in church and worshiping with other believers can encourage you. You need the emotional truth that goes along with the doctrinal truth. And so as our musicians come in just a second, as one way of applying this message, I, I gave you three areas really. Get to know your elders, get to know your doctrine, but also be faithful in your worship. And as you do that, because God is faithful and we're not relying on ourselves, we're just seeking to know him, because God is faithful, he will keep you and preserve you. And I believe that as you are faithful in passing down the faith to your kids, is it a guarantee? No, it's not. But God uses his word, and so you should use it as you try to pass the faith down and trust that God will use it and God will bless. What's your alternative? Are you gonna try to disciple your kids by not using the word? That's not gonna work. And so I wanna encourage you, be faithful in worship, be faithful in study, and be faithful in knowing the men who are responsible for leading you. And in all of this, we're gonna trust that God himself is faithful. As he has saved us, he will keep us. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, Lord, I ask that just as you have given us your word for encouragement and endurance, that you would grant us endurance, that we would finish this race well. Father, I pray that you would help us to know you in a deep way, that we would embrace all of your truth so that our faith would not be shaken. Father, I pray that you would help us to be humbled before you to receive this. And I ask that you would give us the joy of knowing you well that our joy would increase the longer we know you, that it would be richer and fuller because we've seen you accurately in your word and our hearts have rejoiced in who you are. 
I pray that you'd bless this time of worship, that our hearts would be encouraged as we lift our voices together. And I pray that we would be strengthened in the faith. And it's in Jesus' name I ask you. Amen.